I'm a marine archaeologist, which means I spend my days retrieving, restoring, and occasionally interpreting recoveries from shipwrecks in drowned cities. It's much less exciting than it sounds, and most of my time is spent in tedium. That was until recently. Last year, in the discovery of a vessel in the North Atlantic, the exact location I'm keeping quiet to avoid people prying into where this might be, as it was all over the news, it led to the most bizarre artifact of my career. The personal diary of a captain sailing on behalf of royalty in the early half of the 19th century. The papers were heavily damaged, and it's only through technology developed in the last 10 years that we've been able to restore their contents to readability. But still, it's slow going, and most of the diary is being processed. However, what we have managed to unearth is so strange and, quite frankly, terrifying, that my team is hesitant to publish our findings in the usual scholarly journals, as its contents defy explanation and might tarnish our reputations. The language is a bit stodgy, as one might expect for the time, but still, imminently readable. The entries up until early August of 1834 are boilerplate and even mundane. It is at that point that things take a turn. Below, I have replicated the beginning of what we were restored thus far of that section, with some pertinent details and names changed to avoid people trying to find evidence of this wreck or the captain, and thus find out my identity. If there's interest, I'll post more as it becomes available. Captain Artemis Jones, August 5th, 1834. Beyond the portal revealed only a dark and tremulous sky. The ship bobbed and slapped the water like a placental mass. The churning froth of the impatient swells ran down the narrow glass like desiccated fingers, and reminded me of how close I was to the infinite blue darkness below. Sleep had come fitfully over the past few weeks, like a stranger to my bed. Every dream was of the ocean, every thought of the sea. When my eyes closed, I was reminded of the deep, and then of her. Oh, Larissa, how your absence wounds me, a dagger in my chest. I long for every crevice, to smooth every caress. You were my beacon, deadly, angry, and beautiful, and strange as each crash of wave on the hull. I can still feel the slip of your fingers as they fell through mine. Golden hair like sunlit paint in the water as you sank. Sir, came the voice from behind me, gruff and tired. I turned my head just slightly, enough to let him know that I was aware of him. The fog is too heavy, no landfall. I nodded and he disappeared with the rough creak of the door closing behind him. This wouldn't do, not with the pains coming to the man. The barrels of lemon juice had begun to turn, and soon the blight would take over the ship. Some men were hardier than others, but eventually all would succumb to the scurvy, given much more restless wandering. Scurvy is a desperate man's disease, and we had passed desperation some time ago. Oh my love, my pirouette of soul, what horrors I would undertake to find your lips pressed against mine again to feel your bosom bear against my chest. Instead, all I can do now is see of you in this inky blackness that swallowed you. We were told of the island that beckons us eight months prior. It was a land of golden dreams and the promise of great wealth and power. The book, or what was of the book, but had become a few fragmented and burnt pages of ancient Assyrian, accessible by the worthy and the brave. It contained wonders that few eyes had seen, and possible towers of stone and metal, weapons of lightning and fire, and a radiant pool that healed all sickness and abated death. The remains of that tome had come to the attention of Her Majesty, and by the way of spice traders that had bestowed it upon her as a gift of honor, so that their nations might exchange goods freely. There were those who said that the book was only a fairy tale. A story told only to astound. 
but her highness was convinced of its true providence. She collected the best of her navy and selected the most loyal for this important task. By finding the lost island, her power would not only be extended, but eternal. Yet these endless months have worn on us. The men are becoming restless, angry, and sullen. As spirits darken, so too does my command. I could not yet think of deadly mutiny, nor would any man or board dare speak of it, but it exists as a phantom that haunts their thoughts. Yet such ghosts can all too quickly be made flesh, and I cannot allow that to happen. If these stories are just that, then we must make landfall soon at any port, or I fear what might befall us. Whether at the grip of sickness or a sedia sword, either the end of us all. Despite the suffering of the crew, I am beset by my own torture. The sweet purple kiss of opium was the only lover I had known for some time now. A gentle affair at first to smother the grief that burned my nightly thoughts. It was now the only way that I could sleep. No longer just an analgesic, but a necessary rite of passage to daily functionality. I had been wearily watching the once abundant lump on sticky tar that I had kept in a polished lockbox under my bed, diminished into a pathetic, grimy ball. The symptoms of withdrawal from my increasingly stingy slices into the grotesque pipe that I smoked from were building in intensity each day. Even as I lie awake now, the stained cotton sheets are at once stiflingly hot and yet inadequate for the cold shocks that rumble through me like phantom winds. Aside from vacillations between feverish and inflamed, sometimes within minutes of each other, my muscles are leading a mutiny against me, seizing into tremendous cramps and gnawing like vicious, starving wolves. I will again attempt to rest, one of my few remaining pleasures. August 7th, 1834. The shrieks began some time in the night. The teeth of the ship ground up into the water, a grim caterwauling of creaking boards and reinforced iron bands holding everything together, but only just. And underneath, the crashing thunder of waves was a terrible howling. A gurgling, screeching noise rose and fell with the ocean, unnatural and unyielding. I awoke from my thin rest with a start, a sudden cramp in my legs sending shocks of horrific pain through my body. Symptoms of the black illness clawed at me to remind me of my habituation. My agony was almost as loud as the monstrous yells from outside. As my composure returned, I dressed and I made myself known on deck. The whole ship had been roused by the strange noises, and the men, already tortured by their failing bodies, looked to me for answer to whatever fresh wickedness this was. My resolve was tempered by the soaked sweat of the opium ills befalling me, but I bore down and I hid such sufferings from them. For me to be confident in purpose and thought was all that held this ship together, and at times I felt the very hull would crack in half if I showed the least of concern. Rain tickled my cheeks as I pressed my hands to the ship rail, staring out into the oppressive night. Despite the weather, I could see the heavens through the breaks in the clouds. The stars, Captain. I nodded to my first mate, noticing the veneer of blood coating his gums. The scourge was preying on him faster than most of the crew, and I only spared a moment's thought to losing my loyalist man and the consequences thereof. The stars made no sense here. They sat in silent judgment, shattered flecks in the darkness. What is this unfamiliar twilight above my head? The North Star had vanished, and all of her children replaced by strange constellations that I had never seen. Pock marked into the sky as haphazardly as birdshot. And despite the sun long exiting the day, a burning glow bade us towards the horizon. Reddish gold in hue, yet not as sunlight, something else entirely. Might this be what we seek? And one of the screams surrounding us, the sound warbled and dug deep as a sharpened blade, 
a nauseating garble of broken glass. It was as if a cavern to hell had opened in the depths of the ocean, and the cries of eternally tortured souls bubbled up like an abyssal choir, warped and deformed by the layers of water between them and us. Starboard! All heads turned at the shout. A midshipman, Harper, pointed forcefully over the edge of the rail to the waves below. I rushed with the others to see his fright, and was greeted with the stony blackness of rough waters. I demanded he'd tell me what he saw, and only then witnessed the fear in his eyes. It was like a man, but wretched, scaly and dark and terrible captain. It had arms, but not like us, loose and slippery like sir, and its face was the worst of all. I could only see blackness in his eyes, blackness and evil, and I don't know, but, but, speak, I commanded. It seemed to almost smile at me, sir, a horrible grin of razor teeth, teeth that were meant for me. I don't know how I know, but I do. That creature, what it may be, is out to have me dead, dead or worse, Captain. It means to pull me into those empty eyes and have me as a part of it. Deranged, he gripped me by the shirt collar and tugged, begging with his every breath that I save him from this horror he had beheld. I flung his hands for me. Keep your continence, I roared. I ordered two nearby men to take him below deck and have him rest, but I can't forget the pale resignation hanging over him as vultures to a wounded animal. I noticed then that the awful wailing which had broken our dreams had ceased all at once, leaving only the patter of rain and wind. I was too thankful to question it, and maybe the least bit superstitious. I asked if any others had seen what he claimed. Stone faces and shaking heads answered me. I stole another look over the edge of the ship into the frothing murk beneath us, but I saw only darkness. What will you have for us, sir? With little vigor remaining, I directed our heading to the light in the distance, and that all crew not on night duty returned to their bunks. Uncertainty murmured through their eyes, but they complied nonetheless. I used what little reserves I had to make my way to the quarters, and I fell into an erratic and dreamless night. It would have all been just so much sickness-induced visions and little else to tell, Except that after the sun rose, Harper was nowhere to be found. He had been placed to rest in the crew quarters, panicked and sure that the abomination he swore to have seen was coming to claim him. Our good Dr. Stedman gave him a dram of laudanum to help him rest, and the last he was seen, he was slumbering in a fitful sleep. In the morning, his bed was found soaked with fetid water, smelling of the foulest putrescence. A trail of that blackish liquid leading from the base of his resting place to the porthole only a few steps away. It is rare that I fear anything on the seas but man, sickness, or storm, but this macabre night had shaken me. I could not believe that what had happened was anything more than a man driven mad by too many days out on the sea, flinging himself into oblivion to complete his fatalism. Yet what of the water and its rotten odor? and the cries rising up from the waves in the night. If this is beyond the normal ways of the world, then let this be the only time it shows itself to us. All we can do is sail on. And wait. I'm sorry, I have to stop for now. The original transcription of the papers is on an air gap computer in our restoration lab in the university, and all USB connections are logged so I have to manually transcribe everything out of my own laptop, which is pretty time-consuming. And besides that, it's late here, and I'm all alone in this cramped basement space. I know what happens in the next part of this diary, and I don't want to be here by myself this late when I write it. I'll continue this soon. I'm not one to believe anything paranormal. I'm a scientist of sorts anyway. At the least, I have a PhD, so I should be concerned with provable fact, or at least with the best understanding of the historicity of a document. 
but this diary is beyond bizarre. Being here at night and transcribing the word of this man long dead, a man whose stoicism starts slipping, and his mind with it, is unsettling. Every place is different after dark, especially a university basement. With its labyrinthine maze of hallways and doors, the lighting shuttered to a bare minimum to save on electrical costs. I keep feeling like I have eyes on me, and something just at the corners of my vision. It's just nerves. It's me spooking myself out with what's probably only the mental decline of a man suffering from opioid withdrawals and scurvy. But I would imagine even the most hardcore skeptic would be hard pressed to read through this next section in a musty underground room, all alone at night, and not be the least bit on edge. Anyway, sorry for the long prologue. I just wanted to get that off my chest. This next bit that I got through before calling it a night starts right after the last entry. The 8th of August, 1834. The sun is gone from the sky hours before it was meant to leave. If young Harper's disappearance was a tragedy, this is surely an omen. Presswood is a good man. He has been with me in some capacity for the length of my career. Sturdy, strong, and tall. He's been called that damn big tree, in both a gentle jest and cursing his uncompromising nature. He is imposing when needed, and loyal beyond measure. It baffles that his is the body most ready to fall to the blight. I have been lucky to see only the beginnings of scurvy at the ends of long journeys on the seas. The symptoms were bothersome, but not ruinous. Yet now I see the end of this vital beast of a man as he withers before my eyes, and in his disintegration, my own is mirrored back. Every bumper nick heals as slow as a ship in still water, bruising into spreading purple masses deep in the flesh. I have read of what's to come. Gums will bleed uncontrollably and teeth will rot in their crevices, falling out as the bone disconnects from their socket from decay. The bruising belly darker turns under the skin, a ruinous plague that had already begun eating away at us. A broken bone would be the end of any man, as it would refuse to heal and soon reveal gangrenous caverns that would bleed and collapse veins. I am ashamed of my cowardice in the face of this horror. So desperate was I to rest and remove my mind from its effects, that I carefully scraped every interior wall of my box of opium before melting the edges of the pipe to get every stray formation. Even my considered efforts were only enough for the mildest relief. With my frustration, I threw the pipe with force against the wall, shattering it and leaving me with shards of vacant glass to travel eventually to my feet some bitter night. The light on the horizon grows closer. It is on this slim hope of strange luminescence that we hang our dreams and desires. Whether it be the fabled land of the tax or just dry land and greenery, we should be thankful either way. In those hopes, my weary mind spins tales of my lost love. Somewhere in this lethargy, I felt your fingers touch my chest. It was soft as delicate music, warm like embers in sunlight. But mere imagination trembles off my madness. Larissa, I would need but moments, seconds, to tell you how I crave your lips on mine, and beg forgiveness for any trespasses against you. If only things could be different. If only I could have loved you better. You left on your own accord. You went to that boat to leave the seas, to leave me. But you slipped and fell into the waves without waking me from my angry slumber. I can still imagine that fretful glance as you clawed on the ship, wanting for purchase on the slippery wood, but finding the water too heavy a foe. My heart was embittered towards the water, yet I remain drawn to it. Perhaps my punishment for your death is this tortured wander beneath unfamiliar skies and my body atrophies. Maybe I deserve it. The 9th of August, 1834. I didn't sleep again last night. There were two more disappearances. The Williams brothers, bunkmates, were absent at the slight taunt of light that the sun had gave us. More Mount Duras waters soaked into the sheets, spread to the walls of the ship. Oddly, the trail of liquid didn't lead to a porthole, 
but merely splashed against the interior hull, leaving only a dark stain. No one saw them vanish, or heard any frights of sound, leaving their absence as mysterious as young Harper. The men now refuse to sleep in their quarters, as they fear the silent, unseen movements of the horrors that had seemed to pull more of their comrades to their watery death. We all congregate on the deck now, only going below to retrieve our dwindling supplies. The 10th of August, 1834. For the past few nights, the screaming has woken all of us. We simply cannot rest. The men have begun stuffing wads of cotton ripped from their shirts into their ears, but it's as if the sound enters our very minds. Perpetual darkness is all that we have. The sun has abandoned us, left us to our own devices and horrors. A fever grips me, shaking and angry. First made press what is being battered is anticipated. His body creaks like the very hull grinding into the crash of sea. Pustules have formed along his back and neck, oozing sickly greens and yellows that smell of disease and death, with a black spread of blood pooling under his skin, mostly running through the length of his legs. How is it, old friend? I asked, but he could only just nod, saving his reserves to suppress the misery that wrapped around him. The supplies have been exhausted, leaving us all to our own pains. The only lights are the dwindling oil lamps and the approaching glow of blood red in the distance, ever closer. The stars seem as indecisive in their positions or existence as crackling fire. We can no longer navigate by anything other than the ceaseless movement of the light. That terrible light. I need to sleep. I need to sleep. I need... The 11th of August, 1834. That same dream over and over. She sinks into the angry blackness, yells at me, shrieks in horror, and I can only watch frozen as her face pulls into a terrifying grin of anguish and laughter, until her skin tears in flayed ribbons of flesh, revealing a grotesque, bleeding hollow of a mouth and empty eyes. Perhaps the opioid pains are abating. The chills are relaxing and the crippling shocks through my muscles have eased. Yet the needling of scurvy creeps up behind it, walking on spider legs into my nerves. My mouth aches, my teeth quivering. Do they loosen? That can't be so. I've been paid more frequent visits by Stedman, whose medical expertise is failing us without a way to abate the crippling starvation of mine that this sickness brings. Give me some joy, give me some hope, maudlin sorrow. I have never beheld such bright and terrible lights in the night sky. I long for the safety of the bright sun, or even only the crimson sickness that looms larger every day. I've heard tales of green, wavering lights in the northern skies, but this is more than that. Awful colors, colors like no man should see hovering above as if it's ready to drop and press into us. We no longer sleep. We can't. We spend our time on deck, wrapped in torn blankets, wandering aimlessly like lost spirits. My ever-faithful first mate, our loyal Presswood, shivers without control now. No matter if heat or cover diminishes his pain, his eyes have begun to run drips and drops of mottled gelatinous blood at their own desire rendering him blinded by his own black and refuse. A spasmodic lurching corpse that has not realized that it's already dead. The shrieking noise from the water is unrelenting. More and more men have reported seeing the malignancies that splash and circle in the churn of arcane waves. I remain without knowledge of them, save for the vague descriptions that were given. Their arms are simultaneously rigid, yet slithery as a hundred serpents. They may have twisted claws and cracked skin that nonetheless quivers and pulses with disturbing movements, as if made of choking worms. But they all say the same thing. The eyes. The terrible black eyes. Even the slightest gaze into their horror bewilders and saps any resolve from even the bravest man. All the men that have witnessed them have pulled together in the center of the deck, rocking endlessly whispering godless mutters that sound like their own doom. 
Any comfort or solace I try to give is met with blank stares and indifference. With no will left to help those that can't be helped, I leave them to their misery. Let this end. The 12th of August. I was asleep. I dreamed it again, but I woke at the sound of shouts and splashes. As was told by the bleak, half line presswood, each man tormented by the black-eyed visions of these monsters that surround us with their profane noises, stopped their repetitive motions and stood. Unresponsive to speech or touch, they walked to the edges of the deck, spread their arms, and they fell forward into the water. I awoke to the rest of the crew yelling and scrambling to grab them. My mind fogged and lost for moments. There were only splashes and screams, whipped into the crying yowls of the demon ocean creatures. Presswood, bless his frail bones, managed to grab Brownsmith, his lanky frame all of 19 years and suffering all the more for it. Others piled on and fought him as he thrashed, spit and bit those who dared to try to stop him from his baneful desire to end his life. I squared myself to him, and I smacked him broad in the face, stunning him for only a flash of light until his eyes bore into mine like daggers to flesh. All roads lead to the island. He said it with such a simplicity, and he's an understanding that everybody took aback, giving him just the time he needed to spring to his feet and plummet off the edge of the ship. We gripped the sides and we watched as he fell into the waves. Yet he did not sink. He looked back up at us and we watched. We all watched. As the stygian grin on his face crept to a black, toothless maw, oozing black blood and vile, metific sludge the color of infection. His eyes fell into the back of his skull, and the skin on his face was torn by the lancinating fingertips that were only bone sharp into deadly points. Underneath the muscle and skin were not redder pink as with men, but bilious greens and blacks, scaly and pulsating in rhythm with the indomitable sea. The sound that escaped what would have been his mouth was the most horrid kind of nightmare that I had ever witnessed. It was the descendant, all eating choir that had haunted us for many nights, except no longer muted by the swell of water. Loud, piercing, and deadly, we all were tossed about in the maelstrom. And just as quick, he, it was gone, swallowed by the heaving profusions of water. Without need to discuss it, we all left the deck and collected ourselves together in the crew quarters. We sit encircled in the center of the room, watching with grim determination for what we know to come. For we have all seen the face of the black-eyed ones, and we know what befalls all who are caught in their gaze. All right, I can't do this right now. The sounds in this place, it's just the university's old pipes, I'm sure. I may never have noticed them before because I've never been so on edge, or here in such darkness. I didn't realize that it was nearly 3 a.m., far too late. You know sometimes when you're alone, you hear somebody say your name, like the faintest whisper maybe just behind you. That keeps happening, but I'm sure it's nothing. Regardless, I'm going to cut my losses and head to my warm, comfortable bed, and try to get a few hours before I have to be back up and working again in the morning. I'll get back to this soon. I promise. I hope. I'm having trouble sleeping. I can get to sleep, but it keeps getting interrupted by the same dream. I'm on a rowboat in the ocean. It's cloudy overhead. I can't tell if it's going to be daylight soon or if it's just about to turn to night. The water is dark, impenetrable, but calm. I try to row, but I can't seem to go anywhere. All around me is endless black water and silence under a gunmetal sky. And then I hear it. The sound from below. It's growing louder, but I can't tell what it is. A whistling, but deeper. Bubbles start to rise from the depths and surround me, more and more as the noise, now shrieking, angry, rises up to meet me. I try to row, but my boat won't budge. More churning froth and now a rumbling, something big approaching from underneath. Not knowing what else to do, 
I look over the edge to see this giant figure in the blackness below, round and terrible, a giant mouth opening wider and wider as it comes for me. And just as the surface breaks and I see these large, horrible teeth, row after row in a cavernous maw leading to infinite darkness, I wake up. I'm probably just tired, just getting in my head. I'm convinced these dreams will stop if I just finish what I started and I complete the rest of this diary. The last few entries hadn't been formally compiled yet, so I'm doing it alone here, in the dark. I don't know how this will end, but I need to find out for my own sanity. The entry skipped many days and the contents of those hours unknown. It begins without a date. The rough churn of water cracked as the ship beached on the sands. Black sands, sparkling, iridescent, an unnatural color that I've never beheld. The few who remained on the crew threw themselves from the bow and ran into the embrace of the strange island that we had come upon. An impenetrable wall of obsidian stone prevented any of us from progressing beyond a few yards into the beach. It was sheer, impossible to climb and wrapped the island like a lover in its cold, jagged arms. The land was barren of tree, fruit, leaf, or substance. It was farren land, with no more warmth than the starless sky. We were all tired and rotting from the inside. Upon arrival, the men had touched down into the waves, but I refused. I would never touch that water. It was unnatural, and I would not let it cross my skin. I held off until the waves abated before going onto the sands. As I went inland, my long-suffering first mate called to me. Sir, come at once. His voice was frail yet carried in the still air. I followed its source and I discovered the entrance to a cavern, seemingly carved into the rock. Not deep, but hidden by the opaque stone and darkness. I stumbled into its mouth and I saw Presswood leaning against a rock wall supporting himself as best as he could with the pains that came from his decay. Below him was a charred body, twisted as if writhing in agony when it was set ablaze. The body smoked as if somebody had just extinguished the fire. The smell was noxious and horrid, the smell I recognized from dark times past. Presswood pulled the tuft of his shirt over his nose, a vain attempt to smother the odor. His head caught and he bent over the wretched figure to remove a piece of partially burned paper from his hand. Upon its removal, the fingers of the hand simply decayed to flakes of ash that flooded to a damp, rocky earth. He examined it, confused. Captain, I'm not certain, but I recognize your hand in these words. The scrap of paper was charred, but the smudged ink on it was legible. And it was indeed my writing. All the words led back to the island. Without haste, I fell to the twisted figure on the ground and I clawed at the corpse's jaw until it cracked open with a retching, nauseating sound. I looked inside the mouth and I nearly left my body with shock. Presswood bent to me and placed his hand on my shoulder. What is it, sir? And I told him. The bad two molars on the bottom right of his defamed body were missing as they were in my own mouth. It was me. The body was mine. I'm so tired. Did the clock on the wall stop ticking? This basement is darker than before. Let me see. Okay, this is strange. I can't find my way out of here. It's always been out the hall, turn right, turn right again, and then take a left up to the stairs. But there were no stairs. I turned right twice and I found only an empty hall with locked doors. Thinking I might just be punchy and sleep deprived, I backtracked and went the other direction but there was only another wall. I went down every hallway that I could find. I even drew a crude map to find my way but there's no exit. I tried every door, sought out a window, a vent, anything. I even attempted to break the glass portals on the doors to find the water. I mean the exit. Shit, I'm so tired. I have to keep going. The ocean calls to me. The waves are home to the dark ones with their red-black eyes. Those eyes are where I must rest. Soon. 
Soon I will show you. Captain. Presswood collapsed and I turned to him. He had only time to point behind me before thick, chunky bile vomited from his mouth onto my chest. His body seized into terrifying spasms as he choked on the blood drowning him from the inside. Soon enough, he was still. I looked behind me and beheld the man standing at the cavern entrance. Silhouetted by darkness and an unsettling red glow, their shapes had shifted. No longer men, no longer anything human. The light from an unseen moon caught the slimy sheen of water covering their transformed skin. They were hunched, animalistic, breathing as if underwater. Captain, Captain come, come outside. outside. Come, come to the to water. The water. The voices, all of them blended like slurry, viscous and suffocating. They spoke not in words, but in globs. She, she waits for you in the darkness, the darkness of the seas, seas Captain. Captain. I stood and I spat my words at them. Then show me, cowards. Have her come and speak these words to me. A slithering, sickened noise as they skulked away. No answer for my challenge. I thought that my torture had ended, but no, no, there was yet one more horror to whisper sweet songs to me. The lilting, sinewy voice that rose was not distended and aggrieved as the others, but was as beautiful as sunlight. It was hers. Oh, my love, my terrible beauty. I pulled myself to the mouth of the cavern and I looked into the eternal rain and night. I could not see her. I could not see anything. But the song was her. I recognized it. I remembered it. I called out to her. I called. Larissa, please come home to me. I would spend a thousand years in that inky blackness if it meant I could hold her again. To touch her soft lips with mine. To listen as she spoke to me with her voice as melody. But I knew to find her again. I must venture forth. I must leave this place, this frozen comfort and let the waves take me. I with this, I must sleep. I must have one more night of rest to know what I must do. They have all gone. There is no sun or sky, there is nothing but this place, an echo of a greater wail in the cavern of the ocean black. But I see now with truer eyes than ever before. Would though I succumb to my misery, to my desire to end this torture, then all I need to do is follow the lead of the burned corpse that held the paper bearing my words. Yet I am compelled elsewhere. If I were to do so, to damn myself to oblivion, then Larissa would never be mine again. I heard her song and words in the waves and under the screams as the others became those beasts that I thought were monsters. The men are not gone, and nor shall I be. I can wait. I can imbue the words of this document with purpose and understanding for all who witness it. Because to escape this place, one must come in my stead. And to know who I am, others must read of these words, in the same way that I read the words from the accursed book that was gifted to Her Majesty. The same words that drew us here. By understanding them, they also understood me. For a man needn't venture into the seas to explore with his curiosity. He need only seek with his mind, and the strange mutterings in the dark will find him all by themselves, as they found me. I will write the last of these words and place him in the ship to set adrift. The one who finds them, compelled to seek out the finality of my story, will know me, and I will know them. There cease the words. I see no more the man I was in the mirror. This face will do for now. This place is strange with glowing windows of text and color. All who read these words are as I was, as this body was. But they shall slumber in the black eyes of the deep as I once did. But I am now awoken. I can hear the beat of your heart, the thrum of it in your ears. Your breath quickens, your pulse louder and faster. By knowing the words that I have written, you have invited us into your mind. We know you now. We can hear you. We can see you. You shall know us all soon. 
Wait. Listen. For the sound of the ocean. And when you hear it, you shall be with us. <laughs>